Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is uh, our Peg Talks for 2018-2019 school year. And my husband, Neil, and I have uh, been fortunate and blessed to get to know Richard and his wife, Debbie, over the last few years and become friends with them. Um, I know that we're all concerned about raising a well-balanced child, and so we're very excited and grateful to have Richard here with us to share his experiences and his wisdom. Richard Watts is a personal advisor and legal counsel to some of the wealthiest families in America. He writes and has contributed to numerous publications, including Forbes, CNBC, Variety Magazine, The Globe and Mail, The Huffington Post, OC Register, The Guardian in the UK, The Washington Times, and has appeared on CBS, ABC, KTLA, and multiple times on NPR. Richard speaks internationally on issues of wealth with parenting, and the American family. <laughs> Richard was admitted to practice law in California in 1982 and is an alumnus of the Harvard Business School. Variety Magazine calls Richard one of the nation's leading experts on the issues of child entitlement and the effects of wealth. Please join me in wel welcoming my friend, Richard Watts. Thank you, Charlene. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm excited to be here. My voice is a little scratchy. I apologize for that, but I think I can, I can get through this well enough. Um, I thank you for having me here. I'm passionate about this topic. I think you must be too. There must be questions in your mind as well. Um, before I begin, my staff always says to me, Rich, you never give any information about yourself. Hence, I never wind up having contact with people. So I have a face page at Richard Watts, author Richard Watts. I would love you guys to like it so that you can keep up with information that I have from time to time. It's author Richard Watts. Does nothing but good for you, I think. And you'll get a chance there to see the articles that are written. We post very rarely, maybe once a month. But uh, usually it's with significant articles and or interviews that we have. So a little bit about my background. Just a brief bit about my background is that, you know, I grew up uh, initially in Michigan for about eight or nine years, moved to California, and I've lived in Orange County ever since. I have a wife and three boys. I have five grandchildren. We all live here in Orange County. Um, I can tell you that in terms of my career, I've been a lawyer, but somewhere way back about 35 years ago, I had a number of wealthy families, and I mean very wealthy families, that came to me and said, we need someone that we can trust. We need someone that can manage everything that happens in our world. Would you be that consigliere for us? And would you please make sure that we're safe? And kind of a stealth ministry that developed for me during that process was taking care of the family and the children and looking downstream to what was happening to the children because we have many families that have second generation, third generation, and now we're on fourth generation of wealth. And it creates all kinds of issues that, unlike most people, I get to see over and over and over again. I'm not trained as a psychologist, but I actually lecture to psychologists all the time because this is actually my laboratory. They get one person at a time. I wind up seeing all of these families, and since the writings and whatnot and traveling, of course, I've got contact with all kinds, hundreds of families that have got all kinds of issues. So. The first book, which was Fables of Fortune, What Rich People Have That You Don't Want, was a book all about the ideas that wealth has got unknown pitfalls that you can't see until you get there. Everybody wants to be there until you get there. And in that book was a chapter five called Children of Entitlement. It was just one of the chapters of the prior book, but it seemed everywhere I traveled talking about the first book, everybody wanted to talk about children of entitlement. That seemed to be a big issue. And so Entitlemania was born from there. And I wrote about all the different issues that I was seeing with regard to the entitlement issue. What you may not know is that entitlement doesn't just live in the world of the wealthy. It doesn't just live in the world of the affluent. I've been in Washington, D.C. lecturing where I've had families come up to me and say, you know, we live in the projects. We're on welfare. I have no husband. I have three kids. 
but my kids wear $130 sneakers to school because I want them not to have the life that I had. I want them to have a better life. And this is all born out of love. That's the part that I want to give to all of you, is that love is the basis of everything that we're doing to our kids, good or bad. So don't put me in a position or make yourselves feel that I'm here saying that you've done something wrong. I think what you've done is you've maybe loved too much. Maybe love has hijacked some of the ability to become a parent, some of your ability to become a parent. Entitlemania I define as a state of mind in which children believe they should have anything that they want, while at the same time believing they shouldn't have to put an effort in to get it. I'm going to say that again. Children should believe that they should have anything that they want, and I don't mean that in a spoiled sense. It's just kind of like, hey, it is. It just is. I just want it. I'd like to have it. Well, where's the connection to what you have to do to get it? I don't know. Nobody taught me. I just don't think I should have to put in an effort. And so kids have that belief that I can tell you grows over time. There are two causes of entitlement or entitlemania, and, and I would really encourage you to read the book. You know, it, it's meaningful what I have to say here, but the book covers so much more territory that I think you need to hear. <clears throat> entitlemania is caused by two very simple things, and if you want to take away from this lecture, I don't use PowerPoint and all that because I don't think it's necessary. I can be really simple. Two things are causing this. One, giving too much. Two, taking away the struggle, period. One, giving too much. Two, taking away the struggle. Now you say, wait a minute, give too much. I'm not giving too much. I mean, I'm giving what everybody else is giving. I watch what other people are doing. I've got some peer thing going on here, especially in a school like this. There's a lot of affluence. This is what the norm is here. But it's not the norm out there. It's the norm here. And so the giving too much to me is framed by this comment. For everything you give your child, you take something away. Everything. For everything you give your child, you take something away. So the question for us as parents is, I may still give it to them, but let's at least understand what it is we're taking away. Let's really evaluate, let's have that discussion Let's husband and wife sit down and have that discussion about what might we be taking away. Do I see Mary over there? So Mary and I talked earlier today, and, and she said to me, I told you I was going to call on you, and she said to me, you know, my, when I was young, I grew up in Newport, but it was different. She said, I had to buy my own car. And I hear that all over the place. I hear that from a lot of people. They have to buy their own car. You say, well, come on. You know, especially in a school like this. We know lots of schools like this. Your child gets to be 16. They're not there yet, but you're thinking about it. Somebody's having that discussion. If they do well, they get their grades. They get to 16. Going to have a car. What kind? Don't know yet. It's going to be used car? Probably not. <laughs> right? Right? So, so I hear this all over the place, and I say to myself, now, you see, I get to see the other side of all of this, right? I get to see the kids that have got the car. I get to see the, car, the kid that gets the used car given to him. I see the kid that earns the used car. I see the kid that gets a new car bought by him, maybe matched by mom and dad, a little better. Something, I see all these derivations. And you say to yourself, giving too much, what in the world? What in the world can giving a car do to a child? What's that all about? That's a simple thing. Just, you're just giving a car. Why? Because you don't want to have, you don't want to have, the fear that that car is going to break down. I remember when my wife was in high school. We met in high school. And I remember when she got a Vega. I think a Vega was the worst car ever made on the entire planet. <laughs> and when it goes bad, it didn't just kind of go bad. She actually was driving it in the heights, La Habra Heights, up in the, I mean, literally no street lights, and the engine fell out. <laughs> no cell phones, by herself, nighttime. What does she take away from that? You know, she had to be resourceful. She was scared. She had to wave someone you know, around. She had to get somebody to help her. 
Not you guys, right? That's too scary for us. We don't want to have our daughters at 16 having any no strangers because they're all carrying axes and they're all heading to the airport to take your kids into the slave market out of the country. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to joke about that because it's, it's a serious subject, but nonetheless, that's our fear. And so my wife learned from that process. And the first thing that she wanted to do when my kids got to be 16 is what? Buy them a new car. Why would you ever take that chance that something like that would happen with your kids? Now, I grew up in a family that was pretty affluent, but kind of wanted to do my own thing. So I insisted, myself, as strange as this might have been, I insisted to my dad that I wanted to buy my own car. And I bought a used van, and it was horrible. And I had to fix it up. My brother, older brother, got a brand new car. But the bottom line of that was is that I told my wife, I don't think we ought to do this. I think we ought to make the kids earn it. I think they ought to have used cars, which is what we decided to do. Okay? So I believe in that case that going to the more stringent decision, because moms and dads get polarized, right? And as you begin to argue over what should happen, where you used to be pretty close in your polarization like this, you begin to pull back. Well, if you're going to do that, I'm, 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 I'm pulling here. And if you, well, if you're going to do that, then, then I'm pulling here. And first thing you know, you've got mom and dad that one is basically saying, give them everything. And the other one's saying, give them nothing. You know, ship them out with no money, no food, give them nothing, <laughs> right? Which is really kind of crazy. But you can see where parents get that way at some point. So back to this idea of giving too much. So recognize that kids are like goldfish. Anybody have goldfish here? Do any of their kids have goldfish? Okay. So one thing you'll know about goldfish is it's up to the feeder to feed them. Goldfish do not feed themselves. They must be fed. I've got a granddaughter that got a goldfish, and she experimented with it by saying, here, little goldfish, eat, and it just ate. She thought it was so cute. So she fed it a little more, and it ate some more, and she fed it a little more, and it ate some more, and eventually in two days, the goldfish died. She was just just horrible, horrified by what had happened. It died. The reason is, is that goldfish don't know when not to be fed. Only the feeder knows when to feed. With kids, kids will take anything and everything you give them. They do not know. They're goldfish. You feed them this, you feed them that, you do these things, and ultimately, they're going to feed on that. And you say, well, how did, where did you ever get so spoiled? Why did you get to this point where you expect that and you expect this? And Well, because the feeder fed and the kids ate because especially at the ages of two and three and four, they're formulating all of that, those habits about what they really want to have, what they think they need to have. So back to, again, this idea of giving too much. The other side of this, and this part you're not going to like, is that the giving too much needs to be reversed by the modeling of not having, about not having. What the heck does that mean, not having? Have you ever not had? Do you ever have something you want that you can afford, and you just say, I'm not going to have it? I'm just not going to have it. I had a client of mine that is, is now living out of state, but he lived up in Newport. And he was a fabulously wealthy young guy. And uh, he came to me one time and he said, you know, I want to buy a boat. And I said, well, OK. Boat sounds good. He says, well, maybe more like a ship. <laughs> and I said, OK. I said, that's probably a good thing for now, because buying the boat and selling the boat, I understand, are the only two times you're going to enjoy it. But do you really need to do that? And he said, yeah, I, wa I want to do it because I can. And I said, why don't you just for once, and I'd represented this guy for a decade, why don't you practice not having? Why don't you just not have the boat? Don't you think it'd be interesting to, to model for your kids and to speak out loud? Mommy and Daddy could have that boat, but we're not going to have it. It's just better that we not have everything that we want. We're used to having everything we want. We work to have everything that we want. But what's that thing about not having? What value is there to that? I can tell you it gets better with practice. There's a guy named Sam Walton that started a company called Walmart. And interestingly, he was a wonderful guy at practicing not having. He basically drove a used Datsun pickup for most of his life because he didn't want 
that model to become important to him. He wanted success, but he didn't want to make the model about money. Warren Buffett does a very similar type of a thing. He really wants to make money about a security a blanket and a protection, but not about creating the need to have things. One more thing about giving too much. What you are ta trying to do, which we all want to do, when you buy that new car, is you're actually trying to transfer your pride to your kids, to your daughter, your son. What does that mean? That means that you remember that used car that you got. You remember how much you struggled to get through paying for gasoline or whatever it is that you did. And by the time you got a car that actually you could count on for going more than 50 or 60 miles without worrying about it breaking down, it just made you so proud. And at some point, each of you here got a new car. And when you got a new car, the first new car you got, the pride you had was incredible. You took really good care of it. You washed it all the time. You made sure that nobody messed with it. Denting it was a catastrophe. People got in it. You made sure that they were clean. They shared gas with you to get where you were going. All of those things were important to you. And now you say to yourself, I'm so proud. I'm just so proud of, I know what that felt like. It feels so proud. I want my daughter to feel that pride. So I'm going to give her a brand new car because she's going to feel just exactly like I did because, because it's just so new, right? And all of a sudden, a couple of weeks go by, and you notice something odd. She's not washed it in two weeks. And then another month go by, and you start to smell something a little bit funny in the car, and you go in the trunk, and you find that there's soccer clothes in there that have just been stuffed in there that have never been washed in like a month, and the whole car reeks and stinks. And so you begin, where's your pride? When I had a car like that, I took good care and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and you should be doing better, and look what you're doing, and all of a sudden, here you go with the expectation of getting on the kids for something that you were the feeder of. You fed them. You fed them. You created that dynamic where the earning part is a little bit more painful. The earning part's a little more painful. So let's go over to the second part about struggle, taking away struggle. Giving too much oftentimes is socioeconomically more prevalent here. Here. The struggle, taking away struggle, happens everywhere. That's something everyone gets to do. There was an article that I wrote for Forbes uh, not too long ago where I coined the phrase, they were talking about helicopter parents. Are you a helicopter parent? Are you someone that you know, hovers around? I don't think so. I don't think so. Helicopter parents were my generation. Helicopter parents were annoying people. <laughs> annoying people. They would just want to be there. They'd want to be at your dance. They'd want to be someone in the back that's chaperoning. They want to be in your school. They want to be involved. They want to do all this stuff. They're just helicopter parents. They're annoying. And eventually what you say is, stop it. Just stop coming around. You're embarrassing me. You're always around. Stop it. Well, I think that's, you know, we always have to, we have to, to aggress through the generations. And in this article, I said, today's generation aren't helicopter parents. They're drone parents. <laughs> and it took off. It just got talked about everywhere, drone parenting. And I said, drone parenting because it's strategic. <laughs> strategic. You know, I want to monitor what they're doing, not only now, but I mean, they're three. They're three. But five years old is important, as is 10, as is 15, as is college applications. Even though there are only three, I'm going to strategically map out what we're going to do. And in the process, I want to make sure that I fly ahead, I spot all the obstacles, and I destroy them. I want them gone. I don't want anybody messing with my kids. If I need tutors, if they don't get a good grade, if something happens, they get harassed, if they fall down and hurt themselves, if they don't get picked on the soccer team, if they need a cry, I am going to be watching. <laughs> and I'm going to be involved, right? So the taking away struggle part is, 
is way more insidious. The reason being that it winds up softening the kids into the future. And let me give you an example that I think you'll remember for a long time. We've had hurricanes. Hurricane Willa just came through, right? Just came through Cat 5 and turned out to be a Cat 3. Now it's, now it's kind of dissipating. We've had hurricanes, and you watch these hurricanes all over the world. And you watch these islands, right? In California, we don't see any of that. You know, it's like, seriously, like there are floods somewhere, and there's hurricanes somewhere, and we sit back like it really isn't true, just like a video game that you're just watching the world get destroyed all around you while you stay in this beautiful sunlight and everything seems to be fine. Fires, they're not really near us, you know. Earthquakes, maybe once in a while. But the bottom line is that you have these hurricanes. And when you see pictures, what do you see? You see complete decimation of houses blown away. You see buildings and cars flipping around, and you see dikes broken, and you see all this stuff. But have you ever noticed the palm trees? Palm trees will go down 180 degrees. You'll see them blowing, and you're thinking, that is the stupidest looking tree. That should break. That should break. I mean, it's this big around. It's got this great big thing on the top. It's going all the way to the bottom. You're just waiting for this thing to break. And when the storm's over, these palm trees pop back up. So what you probably don't know is that when a palm tree is a seedling and begins to grow, and it's yay high, it hits its first wind, right, outdoors. And that wind pushes the palm tree's trunk. And what happens is it fractures and breaks. It's little tiny micro fissures that break all the way along the trunk, and it bends. And then those fractures begin to scar. And in the scarring, they have strength. And now it grows up to 10 feet high. And again, now a cat one wind comes. And this palm tree is bent over, not as much as a big storm, but bent over. And that palm tree breaks. Little tiny cracks everywhere, again. And it scars. And the scarring creates this incredibly tough shell. And the thing continues until you wind up with a 100-foot palm tree who and which has now buffeted the storms of life, cat fives included, has been bent over all the way, and this thing can sustain the winds because the entire trunk is nothing but scarring and breaking and scarring and breaking. So as parents, what we do is we grab our little kids with love, because we love them. We really do love them. And we pull them indoors. And we build a greenhouse around it. Put lots of light, lots of food, and we grow it. And we watch it, and we applaud it. My gosh, you're 10 feet tall now, and you're doing just great indoors. And the winds outside are blowing all over the place, but you're indoors, and you're blowing, you go, oh my gosh, happy, happy. We're now to 15 feet, and oh my gosh, I'm so proud. You're exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so here you are now 15 feet. Now you're 20 feet. Now you're 25 feet. Finally, you've got an adult. Maybe that's 18. And then you know what you do? You open up the doors. You take that full-grown palm tree, and you push it out into the wind. And out it stands. That's your child. No scarring, no damage, no healing, no experience. And the first cat, one wind that comes along, knocks it over and breaks it right off. And that's what would happen to a palm tree. It's been done. Breaks it right at the trunk, gone. It needs to be out in that torment. It needs to be able to feel the winds because in the beginning, when they're young, and I mean one, I've even been held, it's controversial, I've always said that entitlement begins in the womb. And people always go, oh my, that, that must be a pro-life thing or something. This is a political statement he's making. I go, no, not at all. I said, I need only look in the eyes of the mother and father to know that that child is going to be treated with everything possible. You can feel it. You can see the organic cribs and the organic mattresses and the organic paint and all the things that are going to make this child indoors grow into that beautiful palm tree so that you can be proud. So taking away the struggle is really, really 
a pervasive thing. It's something that's difficult. And you say, so what do I do? I mean, what am I supposed to do? It's really quite easy. Everyone here has access to the answers. The answers is that life in and of itself creates an incredible amount of opportunity for you to allow the test to occur. That means a little bit of bullying, a little bit of teasing, a bad grade on a test, something that doesn't go quite right. I don't like this sport. I don't like this or that. Letting them feel the rejection. What's interesting is, is that, and I've talked to a couple of you, where you've said, I don't know what, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to give our kids everything we can, but, you know, I didn't get it that way. That's not the way I did it, and I hear that. I hear that all, all across the country. Why do people feel that they need to make it so different than their experience? A very good friend of mine, Bob Woodson from Washington, D.C., he owns the Woodson Center, a nonprofit thing to African-American man that's one of my favorite people in the world, now 82, said, in the process of giving our kids the things that we didn't have, we forget to give them what we did have. In giving our kids the things that we didn't have, we forget to give them what we did have. And what we did have, it didn't go perfect. We struggled. There were times we felt less than. There's times that we felt that we couldn't go forward, you know, that there were, and, and, and how do you work that out? I remember my first year of college, and I had a really warm, loving family and a lot of friends, and I went to a college where I didn't know one person. And I can't believe that at 18 years old, I'm up in the looking around people, and I don't know anybody. There's no get to know any, anybody. They didn't used to have that in college. Just show up. And it was horrifying. But the fact that I look back on that now, and I know what it looked like six months later, gives me a lot of strength. And I still draw on that many, many decades later, is that I know that I can get through anything. So. I promised Charlene that I was going to share something that I've never shared on stage before, but I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant to you. The winds are coming for your kids. The winds are coming. The storms are there. There are a lot of happy times ahead, too, but I can tell you if they're all standing on their own feet and they're relatively self-sufficient and they have recognized that failure is okay. Why? Because you told them about your failures. You always talked about your failures to your kids as they got older. I'm talking older like fourth and fifth and, you know, mommy and daddy. Mommy didn't do that. When I was there, I didn't make the cheerleading squad. I went out for soccer and I didn't make it. I was in seventh grade. I'd never played football in my life. I got cut from the third string football team. I didn't even get a chance to ever snap a ball. I never played, but I wanted to play. That really bugged me, seventh grade. It was like, what? I mean, I'm pretty athletic. I, shouldn't be, I should be able to do that. I remember that like it was yesterday. I would rather that my sons, my three sons, didn't feel that rejection. But it made so much difference in my life. So I shared that with each of my boys as they grew up. You know, dad got cut from the football team. Cuts, you know, like seventh grade. I was scared to go out from then on, so I varsity lettered in three individual sports my freshman year in high school, but I'm never going to play team sports again. Well, is that good or is that bad? I don't know, but it changed me a lot. It made me an individual about a lot of things. It made me really sympathetic to people on teams. I've coached, I coached soccer for 13 years with my boys. I always look for the underdog guy to try to just make it, just affirm him and make him better. So the storms are coming, and how you prepare for them and what you do is about letting the wind in. And you say to yourself, how do I do that? How do I let the wind in? I don't usually use this, but for this crowd, I thought it would be really appropriate. This is camo duct tape. This is for the guys. All you need to do is one little piece like this across the mouth, and then get someone that you know well to bind you to a chair like this. And then just let things happen. And for you ladies, designer duct tape. <laughs> You need to have that. So in, in seriousness, it really is about just individually taking on each of the kids and saying, look it, I want you, I want you to know it's OK to struggle here. I struggled. I want you to know it's OK for you to feel. Mom and dad are here for you with that. But we're not going to just give you the answer. 
We're not just going to make it better. We want you to figure that out. So now let me talk about the wins and the thing that I was going to talk about. I wear this ring for a very significant reason. This is my wedding ring over here. Actually, it's, a, it's for golf, but this is my father's wedding ring. And in it is a date. On it, in the inside, is a date. It's got my dad's initials and my mom's initials. And it's 1946, April 26. And the reason that I wear it is it's significant to my belief about what happens in life. When this ring was put on my father's finger in 1946, things were perfect. Very few wins. We lived in Detroit, Michigan, actually Livonia, Michigan. Very few wins. It was perfect. It's what, what marriage is all about. It's going to be 40, 50 years of bliss. So here it is. Here's the ring. Went on his finger. They had their first daughter, Lonnie, my oldest sister, three and a half years old. Lived in a beautiful home. My grandfather was very wealthy. Uh, my, my family on that side, on my mother's side, was quite wealthy. They had the boats, and they had stuff, and they had homes and things like that. And the winds were coming. And at three and a half years old, my mom decided we need to move to a bigger, nicer home. We need to kind of upscale a little bit. So she had a realtor over in the wintertime looking at their four-acre estate in Livonia, Michigan. And she showed the realtor the outside and the back and the gate, and then she opened the gate, went back, and she came back in and said, that's all that property down there and the beautiful stream running through there and all frozen snow. She went back in the house, and the winds were coming. Lonnie, at three and a half years old, their first and only child at the time, got out the gate that she left open. She found a little saucer that she liked to work with at three and a half years old. And she slid down a little tiny hill right next to their house that goes down to a stream that was frozen. Only three foot, not big. But just to the left of the stream was a little bridge. And at the bridge, there was a waterfall. And there was a hole about four foot square that hasn't, hadn't frozen. Hadn't froze, excuse me. And Lonnie went in there and died. The winds all of a sudden were blowing huge. I wasn't born yet, but can you imagine a 30-year-old dad and a mom who is new to a beautiful daughter thinking, life is over. The winds are coming. Well, she jumped in. She ran. She saw the footsteps. She ran in, and Lonnie was face up underneath the ice, looking at her underneath the ice. And for the next 10 years of my life, 10 years of her life, she felt so much guilt that she began to regularly try to take her life. And in that process, now we're talking 1950s, in that process, uh, she would go to a psychiatric ward and she would be, you know, she had all the money in the world because of my grandfather. And she would be tested and they said, you know, she's obviously got this huge depression and these problems and she's taking pills and trying to kill herself. And over a period of three children, three children, my older brother is three years older than me, and then myself and my two-year younger sister. The winds were blowing like crazy. Interestingly, I never saw my mom. I just don't ever remember, ever, from age five, four that I remember, until we left at nine, I don't ever remember seeing her. She was always in the hospital. And in those days, I don't know if you've seen One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, but the way they used to treat those is they'd put the things on your head, they'd put the thing in your mouth, and they would hit her with a jolt to try to stop the pain that she was feeling. Now, how does a family recover from that? How do you all, how would you recover from that? You know, what, what goes from there? Well, I was parsed out to my grandmother in Ohio. My other brother and sister were all over the place. I remember a nanny named Cammie that loved me, but I was in Ohio much of the time, and I was back and forth trying to do things. I remember walking to school because my dad had to go to work. There was no mom there. Mom was gone completely institutionalized by the time we left when I was nine. And you ask me now about how my childhood was? It was great. I had a great childhood. It's what I learned. It's what I did. I got loved by a grandmother. I had terrible things that were happening all around. But it all turned out fine. So we moved to California, and I then had a stepmom that came into the picture at that point because my mother was committed in Canada to the day she died at 72. Never able to get over the loss and the fault for having caused, in her mind, the death of her daughter. And at that time, we moved to California. I had a stepmom. Well, guess what happens? Stepmom gets breast cancer. 
wow. So I remember seeing her and she had big breasts and one was completely gone and all carved out here and that's the way it was for a number of years until she died. And then my dad, just several years after that, when I was 36, he got cancer and he died. But I can tell you something. It was really difficult. It's difficult to look at this and know that it went on his finger and that life and the winds of life took their effect. But I'm one of the kids. I'm like one of your kids, right? The winds are blowing. And that was all strengthening to me. There's very little you can tell me about life that depresses me or that gets me down. I think I've learned to overcome everything. I love people. I love my family. We've got a close family. And so you think, wow, I've been in Cat 3 when Dad died at 36, and Mom was already gone, Cat 4. Dad was pretty well off. All of his thing through mismanagement of taking care of my mom was gone. No inheritance, zero. We've been pretty well protected. Now we get nothing 30, 30 years ago, 28 years ago. But it's OK, because we were resourceful, and all of us came out OK, brothers and sisters and my stepbrother, who was born to my mother that passed away. So now you fast forward. The winds are coming. I've already experienced cat four, right? category four. I'm good. You want your kids to be good, too. It's not going to be that way if you completely always take away all of the struggle that they've got, if you make it so easy on them. So now we fast forward to my mistake. You say, well, here's the guy that's the authority. Do I ever make this type of mistake? Have I done this? The answer is yes, I'm guilty here. Right here, third son, guilty as charged. My oldest son, we'd launched the first two really well. They did really well. Third one comes along, and he actually did pretty well, too. Maybe the grade's not quite as well. You know, 3.6, we wanted, that's on the 4.0 scale at the time. So the older boys were at 4.0, and he was at 3.6, and shame, shame, right? My gosh, whatever happened to the mechanics in the world for the guys and woodcraft people and people that did things with their hands, you know? Everybody's got to have an MBA these days. And our, we drone parents help them get to that realization that they want to have an MBA when maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. So fast forward now to Russell. He gets done. He graduates from Pepperdine. We're all good. We made all the kids move out of our, our house when they graduated. You're not coming home. But this was the baby, 22, mom says, look, he can come live with our home. We've got a new home in Laguna. He can just stay for a little while. He's making plenty of money. He should be out on his own. I know, but he'll give him a chance to get a head start. He'll be able to save money for stuff. Wrong. Wrong on saving money. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah. Not, they didn't, he didn't learn that part, right? Winston Churchill said, saving is a good idea, especially when your parents do it for you. <laughs> so wrong on that. And so he's there. And I'm thinking, is this going to be like months? And two years later, he was still there, coming in at midnight, partying, having a great time, making good money. But mom and dad, in a place where I can't get mom to move on the, on the issue, I know that I'm hurting him. I know that I'm not strengthening. I know every day that I keep him there, he's not progressing. So I met with him. And I said, Russell, I have a great idea that you're going to come up with. <laughs> he said, what's that, Dad? I said, you're moving out. <laughs> 30 days, your idea. And if you tell your mother, you and I are done for a long time. <laughs> it's your idea. And he goes, gee, Dad, I mean, did I do something wrong? Like, you know, whatever. No, not at all. I've done something wrong. I said, you know, what do you think of me as, Russell? He says, Dad, you're my best friend. If you say that about one of your kids, someone needs to smack you on the head. And I'm serious. It's a very big problem. He said, you're my best friend, Dad. And I said, you know what, son? I want to terminate that relationship. I can't be a good parent and a best friend. You can have plenty of best friends. I'm taking away from you by playing that role because I have superior knowledge to you. I'm a drone. I can fly out ahead. I know what's coming. You don't. I need you to learn on your own. So he went to mom. He said, guess what, mom? I'm moving out. <laughs> you know, like his ID. Didn't sell it really well, but it was good <laughs> enough. And he moved out. And I said, I'm going to help you for three months, and then I don't care if you push a shopping cart. I don't want to hear from you again, except when you come over, you're not allowed to come spend the night. You just stay out. So here's, now I've, now look at me. Now I'm, now I've gotten pretty hard, right? And people look at that and say, gee, that seems harsh. If I'd started earlier, it wouldn't have been so hard. 
and it wouldn't have seemed so harsh. If I just said, like the other boys, hey, when you get done college, you need to find an apartment and start your life. That's what you need to do. And I'm not suggesting that you need to do that, but that was my story. So out he goes, and unbeknownst to me over the next year, real estate crashed. He was in the real estate leasing business with Cushman Wakefield, and his monetary thing crashed. He had some horrible times, but he was so afraid to come to me that he just took out credit cards and stuff, and he destroyed his credit with credit cards because he didn't have any other way to live. And I didn't hear about it. If mom had heard about it or I had heard about it, we would have had the issue of do we rescue him, right? But we didn't hear about it, and he figured it out. He wound up moving from a really fancy apartment that he first got to a secondary one to one that was pretty dumpy with a bunch of guys in it. But he was, he was adapting. He was adapting. So all of that culminated in about a year and a half, he took me to lunch. And I was shocked that he picked up the check at lunch. He picked up the check, like 20 bucks. I thought, wow. And he picked up the check. I felt I wanted to get the check and frame it or something, you know? <laughs> And he said, you know, Dad, he says, I got to tell you something. He said, I've now been out this couple of years. And he said, I can't tell you how much I've learned. And he said, I can't tell you how difficult sometimes have been, really, really difficult. But how come you didn't do this earlier? Why didn't you do this earlier? I mean, I'm really, I'm, I've got friends and stuff that come over. I cook rather than having mom cook at whatever time I want her to cook. I've got friends, I've got all these things that are happening as a result of me being on my own and finding out what I want. So I'd love to tell you that the wind stopped blowing and that was the end of the story, but it's not because at 27, he's now 31, at 27 we were in Hawaii, we rented a house on the North Shore and he came to me and he said, Dad, he says, I've gone to my doctor a couple of times but I've been bleeding out of my rectum here and there. And I just don't know what it is. The doc said you got hemorrhoids. Just give me all this medication. And it just keeps going, it keeps happening, on and off and on and off. And I said, when we get back, I want you to go to my gastro in Newport, and I want him to scope you. And I went to the New Newport guy, and he says, you know, I know him quite well. And he says, they're not going to pay for this health insurance because he's too young. He's 27. And I said, I really don't care. Just scope him. I was there when he came out of, when he was in recovery as he was coming out. And the doctor came in. And he was literally blue in the face. And he said, the tumor is so large in his colon. And it's metastasized already to the lymph nodes that we have to get him into emergency surgery quickly because he needs to have this entire thing, part, portion of his colon cut out. So now the winds are blowing. Now, interestingly, notice the winds are cat five for me. I'm in tears with my wife. They're blowing cat four or five for him. But we're all still standing. We all still know there's hope because we've been down this road. I've been down this road. He's been down this road. He knows where to go with this. So I said to him, I said, from now on, Russell, you're 27. I got no advice for you. You're going into a frontier that I don't know. I don't know what it's like to almost die. I don't know what it's like to be threatened with dying. I don't know. So we're going to take the cue from you. What is it that you want to do? What is it you want to do right now? He's got his cap on, and he's got the little funky booties on, and he says, Doc, when do they need to do surgery? He said, five or six days from now, for sure. He says, if I go out and get something to eat, do I have to re-prep and all that? He says, absolutely. He says, good, I'm going to do that. And Doc says, well, I don't know if you should do that. He says, I need an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> In his world, an In-N-Out burger solved a lot of stuff, right? And we found the whole family. We called all the kids, all my kids. Everyone left their work. Everybody came together. And here we were sitting in Irvine at the In-N-Out, a whole family with a guy that just found out he had metastatic cancer of the colon. And we're all just sitting around eating In-N-Out burger and fries. And it's what he wanted. And from that point forward, he has gone through chemotherapy. A year, he's had the successful operation. We tried to get him to come home in the middle of his chemotherapy because he said he spends most of the nights hugging the toilet at 27 years old in his apartment. And he said to me, Dad, he says, you know something, the one thing you've taught me is that these things make a different person out of me. He says, I don't want to come home. Because he said, every time, every night, when I'm around that toilet, I'm becoming a new man. Tough, really, really tough. But this guy today at 31 years old, is a person that you absolutely would not know from where he was at 26. 
He is as wise at 31 and is capable of telling you where the winds will be blowing for you that you don't even know because he's dealt with it. And we let him deal with it. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I want to leave you with this story about kids, about kids. When my mom and dad died, we were friends, we were participants of the Chris Cathedral. And if you go to the Chris Cathedral, there's a garden there. And there's burial sites, and I wanted a garden. There's nine of them in all the burial sites. And I wanted one for my mother and father and our family. So I bought one of those for my mother and father to be buried. They're the first two people buried at the Chris Cathedral, now the Christ Cathedral. And it's still there. And Schuler came to me and he said, Rich, you know, there's this plaque that's marble, and it's three foot by four foot. And you need to pick something to go on that plaque. And we'll chisel it in there. And I said, well, I'd love to do something original. I, a Bible verse would be easy. And I looked through the Bible, and I kept thinking, I'm, here, I'm a, a writer. And so I'm constantly thinking, oh my gosh, what would I want to say? Do I want to talk about birds and bees? And do I want to talk about plants and trees and earth and God and this and that? And I don't know what to do. And I thought, you know what? The most valuable thing that I could say, and I worked on this for two weeks, and I gave up. And all of a sudden, I get up one morning, and I wrote this line out, which is there now etched in marble. It says, as an admonition to future generations, prevail upon your children that they may know faith, family, our tradition, and the warmth of embrace. For they are both your seed and harvest. And I want to say that again. I said prevail on your children. I didn't say ask your children. I said make it known to them. Be a parent. Be strong to your kids. Know that sometimes parents are going to be not liked. Know that they're not going to have to, they're, they're not going to get an answer to why you said no. They're just going to get no. Because you know better as a parent what's good for them. Prevail on the children, on your children, that they may know faith, family. I want my kids to know family. I want your kids to know family. Our tradition, which means what do you stand for? Are you all about, you know, Things, or are you about experiences? Does your family do things? Do you have traditions? Those are the things that you will pass on as a legacy for them. And the warmth of embrace, for goodness sakes, hug your kids. They really need the affirmation of being hugged. They really need to know that as a parent you love them even though you're being tough on them. For they are both your seed, which is where you all are right now, they are your seed. They're, you're planting them. You're watching them grow, maybe indoors, maybe outdoors. But they're your seed. What's coming for you is the harvest. And the question that I would ask you is, what do you want to harvest? Because you won't be here forever. Your kids are forever going to go forward. One of the great comforts I get now is I see my grandkids learning the same way that my kids did because they're teaching the grandkids. I know they're reaching difficult times, but they're becoming little independent people with their own likes and their own dislikes, their differences, but we affirm all of that. We explore the struggle to allow them to be the special little things they're going to be and not what I think would look good on a college application 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, but really taking the time as a parent to do that. And so the harvest, I ask you, is what do you want to leave someday as a legacy? You're a little young for all of that, but the legacy is coming, and it'll come quicker than you believe. And the legacy that I would hope for you is that you would have kids that would carry on in health and mentally would be people that would change the world because the family is the unit that is most ailing right now, ailing in our country. It's not about politics, and it's not about all the different things that are going on. It really is about family needs to say, this is where the buck stops. Our family here means everything. This is what I'm going to make sure is as strong as I possibly can. So tell me, how do I make that as strong as I can? Do you make that by just ushering that through, pulling that tree indoors? Or do you make that by pushing it out and just saying, look it, I'm watching you, I'm loving you, but I'm going to make sure that you make it through this. You're just going to have to do it on your own. So I'm prayerful that all of you have the harvest that you're looking for. Thank you so much for having me to speak. I really enjoyed it.